Electricity in Rust is extremely useful, but for a lot of newer players, it's kind of complicated. So in this video, we're going to go over what each electrical component does. The first thing you're going to need for any electrical circuit is a source of power, and in Rust, there's three of them. The wind turbine, the solar panel, and the generator. The wind turbine is the best out of the three, generating between 0 and 150 units of power depending on how high you build it up into the air. The solar panel is the second best option at 0 to 20 units of power, and obviously it's only good during the day and has to be facing the sun. And then there's the generator, which generates 40 units of power but requires low grade to run. So it's not the most efficient source of power, but it is portable and easy to set up, and it's useful for things like online raids to power auto turrets for a little bit. The next most important thing to learn about is the batteries, and there's three different sizes that have three different capacities. There's the small battery, which works best with solar panels and has an output of 15, the medium battery, which has a maximum output of 50, and the large battery, which works the best with the wind turbine that has a maximum output of 100. And when you're in game, you can click on the items to see all of these numbers, as well as when you hover over them with the wire tool. Besides your source of power, batteries are the second most important thing in the entire circuit. Batteries can store up quite a large amount of power and last many hours, so even if your sources of power get broken, your circuits will still run off of the batteries. The root combiner is an item that you can use between your sources of power and your batteries. With wind turbines, it can be used to connect two of them together to go to a large battery, used as an extension cord between sources of power to your batteries, and is especially useful for things like solar panels if you're trying to charge up a medium or large battery. Sources of power can be plugged directly into the inputs of your batteries, but you're going to want to use root combiners because eventually you'll need more than one input to the same battery. And without using root combiners, that's not possible. So by taking the output from your wind turbines or your solar panels, you can plug them into the bottom of these root combiners, and if you need to, you can chain the output of the root combiners together. Now the power from the solar panel and wind turbine are connected, and if we wanted to, we can add another solar panel and plug it into the final input on this root combiner. And now we've got three sources of power coming out of the top of this. I'm on the staging testing branch of Rust, so things are acting a little weird over here. I'm going to need to use this item that admins can spawn in called a test generator. So if you're an admin that wants easy sources of power, this is an item that you can use. My wind turbine is not working whatsoever, so I'm going to supplement it for this test generator. Now that our sources of power are connected into a singular output, we can bring that over to our large battery. And you'll notice it has this thing on it when you hover over it with a wire tool called active usage. In our case, we have 140 units of power coming in and we've got no active usage, meaning that 140 units of power will charge the battery until it fills up all of the way. But if I plug the large battery into the medium battery, you can see now we have 100 active usage, meaning that only 40 units of power are being used to charge the extra capacity. The wind turbine and the solar panels output fluctuates, which means you need to make sure you have enough power coming in depending on how much active usage you have. Basically, just make the input bigger than the output. The generator is a bit different because it requires low grade to run and you have to manually turn it on and off. So using it to do something like charge a battery is not the smartest thing in the world to do. Most of the time, people will use generators in their fobs when they're online raiding because it's easy to set up and get things going right away, or people will also use it inside of a cave base. And there's other uses, like if you need to grow some food out in the Arctic, you can throw a generator on to run some lights for a little bit. Another thing to keep in mind, even though it's not very useful, is you can connect the outputs of batteries together with a root combiner to get a larger amount of output power than you would normally get from a single battery. Before a recent update, players never really used electricity for anything more than setting up auto turrets, SAM sites, and farms. But now, after these recent changes to electricity, a lot of the components have an active power usage of zero. This basically means you can fit way more things on a single battery than you could before, making it way more useful to make more complex circuits without wasting a ton of resources. The next two most important things are the electrical branch and the splitter. These basically act as extension cords of your power that can divert exact amounts in the direction you would like it to go. First, we'll start with the electrical branch, which is the most common way to extend the power from your battery. On the top of the electrical branch, there is a branch out, and if you press E, there's a little pop-up that comes up and you can set the exact amount of power that you would like to pass through on this left side. We can then take the left side of this branch with nine power and send it to something like a splitter. That nine power is going to get divided between these three nodes on the bottom of the splitter. And then the remaining 91 power is going to stay on the right side of the electrical branch 
approach that we can use for something else. Also keep in mind what we said earlier about these things using zero power, so we still have a zero active usage from our battery. For now, we're just going to take that remaining power and send it to a new electrical branch. With the nine power we have on our splitter, we're going to take one of each of these nodes and send it to these three components to our right. And then you'll notice we have three power coming out of each of these nodes evenly distributed to the three components on our right. And first, we'll start off with the blocker. This is basically something you can use to block the power from passing through. So if we use the power from this electrical branch we have up here and plug it into the left side of the blocker, you can see the red dot appears and we have an output of zero. The blocker is extremely useful as you can use something to trigger the left side of it to turn something on or turn something off. The next component is the memory cell, which is basically a single bit of RAM. Most of the time this is used in complex circuits when you're trying to toggle something on and off. There's an inverted output and a regular output, a set, a reset, and a toggle. A more simple way to put this is it saves a state of true or false, meaning that power is going to come out either the left side or the right side, depending on whether the light is red or green. So you can see here we've sent the inverted output to the left and the regular output to the right, but only the left side is getting power. And if we power the set node, you can see the state has switched from the left to the right. And then you can also power the reset to change it back to its original state. And then there's the toggle, which does the same thing as the set and reset all in one. So if we bring something out like a button and plug it into the toggle, you can see how it turns it on and off with a single node. And for a beginner electrician, the most common use case for something like a memory cell would be used to reset the state of a trap. The next component is the RAND switch, and it stands for random. It's pretty simple, so we'll connect an electrical branch to the output of the RAND switch to show you how it works. And you can see that it has a set and a reset button on the right side of it. So if we grab something like a button and plug it into the set and push the button, you can see we got a random chance of it allowing pass through. This is also a good use case for the memory cell if you connect both of the outputs of the memory cell into the set and reset of this RAND switch and use the button on the toggle of the memory cell, it would do the same thing of setting and resetting it. But you'd be able to do that with a single button, randomizing the ability for the power to pass through. Next, we're going to go over the three logic gates, the first one being the OR switch. The easiest way to showcase what these logic gates do is in a circuit. This circuit runs this light no matter whether it's day or night, and it switches between the solar power during the day and the battery at night. So just a quick explanation, if you don't know what this is, we've got our solar panels going into our root combiner, which goes into an electrical branch. The left side of the electrical branch is set to charge the battery during the day, and then the output of the battery goes into the blocker. The right side of our solar power goes into a second branch and the left side of that branch disables the battery by blocking the power. And basically what this does is it turns the battery off during the day, and once the solar power runs out, the blocker allows the pass through, turning the battery on. This isn't a particularly useful circuit, but it's great for showcasing what these logic gates do. So you can see here that we have our battery passing through the blocker, running through the OR switch, turning the lights on. And if we use the solar power to turn the blocker on, you can see the lights have now turned off. And that's because I've disabled the solar from the OR switch. If we take the solar power, which is sitting on the right side of this branch right here, and plug it into the OR switch, you can see that the lights have now turned back on. But if we unplug the solar from the blocker and allow the battery to come through, you can see that both lights are now green, and that is the purpose of the OR switch. The largest amount of power will pass through. So if we've got 15 power, and we've got seven coming in on one side, and eight coming in on the other, the eight will take priority, and the seven will sit stagnant. So basically, if you've got two light switches plugged into this OR switch controlling a singular light, it doesn't matter whether or not each are on or off. As long as one is on or both are on, the light will remain on until both are turned off. The second logic gate is the AND switch, and this requires both the A and B inputs to be powered for pass through to be allowed. So you can see here, we've got our solar blocking the battery, so there's no power coming in from the left side. And now we've plugged in our solar into the B side of the AND switch, lighting it up green. But since we don't have the battery coming through, it's not going to power the light. We'd have to disable the solar, allowing the battery to pass through as well, 
and both of these combined allow the AND switch to turn the light on. So it's like one of those situations where you're launching a nuclear missile and you need two keys to be able to do so. If you've only got one key, you're not gonna be able to launch the missile. The final logic gate is the XOR switch. So if we place this down, block our battery, and then take our solar and plug it into the B side, and then plug our battery in for now, and bring this over to our light, you'll see the light turns on, our solar power is passing through the XOR switch, but if we disable the solar and allow our battery to turn on, you'll see that now that both sides are powered, the light has turned off. An example of this is like how hallway lights work. When you turn a switch on and the light turns on, and then you go to the second switch and turn it on, but it turns the lights off instead of on. That's what an XOR switch is, basically. Next up, we've got the timer, and it sounds like what it is. The timer has an input and an output, so we'll grab some power from over here to turn it on. And then if we grab something like a button and put it into the right side and a branch to show it turning on and off, this right side acts as a toggle to turn on the timer. It will allow pass through for the allocated time. And then once it's done, it'll turn off blocking the pass through. When the timer is off, you can press E on it to set the amount of time that you want on it. This is very useful if you want a delayed action to occur or if you're powering something like a sprinkler system in your farm. Then we've got our button that we've been using to showcase a lot of this stuff. The button does not require a power input. It'll give you two units of power just by pushing it with no input. So it's a free source of power to toggle something. And it's very nice to put very far away from a circuit if you're trying to do something like turn your furnaces on from a specific location or if you want to turn on an auto crafter, you can place a button anywhere in your base to do so. Similar to the button but on the floor is the pressure pad. This is something that you can place on the floor. It has an input and an output and it generates one unit of power for a very brief second after stepping on it. And whatever power you give both the pressure pad and the button will pass through once triggered if you need that for any circumstance. Next we have the switch which is a very basic toggle on and off that holds its state. There's not much else to say about it. If you give it some power, it works like a light switch. It stays on or it stays off, and it's got a switch on and a switch off, which can be used in tandem with something like a memory cell. There's also a smart switch, which is our introduction into the Rust Plus app. Certain electrical components in Rust have the ability to communicate with an app that you can download on your phone. So what you can do is power the smart switch and then hold E, and then you'll see this new pop-up where you can pair it with your Rust Plus app and then you'll be able to name it. And then in the Rust Plus app, you'll be able to turn it on and off from your phone. And then we've got the HBHF sensor, which is basically a motion detector. So if you give this thing some power, you can toggle between three different states, authorized players on the TC, unauthorized players on the TC, or both. When it detects a player, it will output one power, which can be used to toggle something. You can see here, I set it to authorized players and I used it to toggle on a smart switch. Then we've got the igniter, which is most popularly used to turn furnaces on in large groups. You'll want to use something to turn it on and off though, because it does make a noise and has durability. So if we grab the output of a button and plug it into the igniter, you can see it'll turn on for a brief second and then turn off, which is enough to turn something on like a fireplace or a bunch of furnaces. Something that has a ton of use cases is the counter. Again, I'm on the staging branch, so it's not acting the way that it should for some reason, but normally you can place it flat against the wall. It has an input and an output, so if we give it some power, you can see that it shows up with the number one, and we can set a target. Basically, there's two different states to this counter. This one is a counter. We can also set it to show pass through, which will tell you the amount of power that is passing through it. And on the right side, you can see we've got an increment, a decrement, and a clear counter. When you're in the other state, you can use those nodes to count up or down, and and clear it. So you can see we're using a button on the increment counter to make it go up. And if we plug it into the decrement counter, it will go down. And whatever the target value that you have set is what the increment counter needs to count up to before the pass through is allowed to open. Next up, we've got the door controller, which is extremely useful. You can place these on doors just like code locks and they've got an input and an output. So we can plop this button down and plug it into the input and the door will open and close automatically. And on the right side of the door controller, there are two nodes and open and a close, and something that you can do is create a circuit to where the pass-through of the door controller automatically closes itself, which can be good for online raid defense where you have one button that closes every door in your base, but does not open them. Then we've got the RF broadcaster and the RF receiver, which is basically wireless electrical toggles. So first up is the broadcaster, which is this little guy right here. He's only got an input, and then the receiver has an input and an output. 
You can interact with both of them by pressing E to set a unique frequency that they will communicate on. So you can see here, we've given both of them power and I'm taking the output of the receiver, which turns the light on because the broadcaster is communicating on channel five and the broadcaster when powered will always give a steady signal. There's also the pager, which you can set a frequency on to communicate with these RF devices. So if we set this to five, our pager will alert us. It has a silent mode and a stop mode. When it's set on silent, it'll vibrate. The biggest use case for this is that the small oil rig, the large oil rig, and the giant excavator have unique frequency codes that you can input to your receiver or your pager to alert you when players are there. Then we've got the laser detector. When powered, a laser will emit, and during the daytime, it's very difficult to see it. When a player walks in front of the laser, the output will be powered, which can be used to trigger something like a trap. Another use case could be placing this on the inside of a garage where your vehicles are at so that when you back up into it, the door will open automatically. Then we have the smart alarm, which interacts with the Rust Plus app on your mobile device. So what you can do is place it down and connect it to something like the new seismic sensor. So when the seismic sensor detects an explosion within the radius around it, it'll send you a notification to your phone and it also has the ability to trigger other things in your circuit. By interacting with it, you can set a custom message that you'll receive on your mobile device. And by holding E on it is how you pair it to your device. We're now on the final stretch with the storage monitor. This is a unique component that can only be placed on a tool cupboard, large storage box, or vending machines. It has a power in and it also has a power out and it can also be paired to the Rust Plus app by pressing E on it. So what this thing is gonna do is it's going to detect movement of items within the box that you have it connected to. I've got it hooked up to a red light right now and you can see when items are moved into it, the light turns on and it also works when the items are taken out. So you can set this up in boxes throughout your base so that if you're getting offline rated, you can get messages to know exactly where they're at in your base and you can also put it on vending machines to get notified whenever you've made to sale. Now we can speed run a few things that are simple. We've got these lights. One of them is a siren light that spins in a circle and the other is a blinker. These have many, many use cases. One of them being connecting it to the status nodes on the auto turret. It has no ammo, low ammo, and then has target for when there's a target that it's detected. And you can connect these to things like lights to know the status of your auto turrets. There is the Tesla coil, which is a trap. And when powered, it'll electrocute people within quite a large radius around it. And it's also got durability. There's the car lift, which you can use to modify vehicles, and then you can interact with it. And once you've got a vehicle on it, you can change the modules, and you'll also be able to add or remove code locks without having to go to the junkyard or the ferry terminal. There's the elevators, which you can stack up on top of each other. And then by bringing power up to the lift, you can plug it into this generator. And then on every single floor of your elevator, there's a node to call the elevator up or down to you. And then we've got the searchlight, which can be used as a spotlight during the nighttime. You can point it at a place to light it up. It gives quite a bit of light. The SAM sight, which is your aerial defense, it now comes with an invert mode, a power in, has target, low ammo, no ammo, and a pass through. When you power up this bad boy, it's got two different modes that you can interact with by holding E, and the one you are looking at is the one you're going to set it to. So you can see here, we're looking at defender mode, which means it's set to all right now. And if we select this, it's now on defender mode. You can also toggle this with some form of a switch so that you can do it from far away without needing to interact with the SAM site directly. And something newer to the SAM site is the pass-through, which means you no longer have to wire up a ton of things. You can just connect them together with the pass-through. Something fun is the target. You can place this guy down and on the back of him, he's got a bunch of nodes that you can interact with. A power in, a power out, a lower, and a raise. This is basically a unique switch, and once it's lowered, it'll allow the power to pass through to something. There's still a bunch more things to go over, like all of the industrial and the farming stuff, which includes water, and then we've also got the targeting station and the drone. I'm gonna be saving the industrial and the farming stuff for future videos. The drone is very simple. You just set it down, interact with it, set a unique name, go to your computer station, input the name, and then you can fly a drone around. The things you can do with electricity and rust is basically infinite. And there's more things like the neon signs, which is signs that you can paint and it'll glow. There are things like the boom box and the laser lights that come with a dance DLC. But that's all I got for you guys today. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video, leave a dislike if you didn't, and I'll catch you in the next one.